Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, symposium of the Vidal Fishing Center, the Center of Anti Semitism. Um, you might ask, indeed, why is this night different from all other nights? And I think the answer is to be found at the table with our three participants, all of whom are experts on Japan. And this is the first time, uh, at least in recent memory, that our centers had the opportunity to hold, host a discussion of uh, the question of uh, Japanese anti-Semitism, or more specifically, of the protocols of the elders of Zion uh, in Japan. Before I introduce uh, the three speakers, and in particular our guest uh, for this evening, uh, Professor David Goodman, I want to say a few words of general introduction about the question of the protocols. Not being a Japanese uh, or, or an Asianist, I leave the specific features of this uh, question to our experts. But I think that anyone who follows with increasing anxiety, the, the state of anti-Semitism around the world will be aware of the fact that the return of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, its current popularity, the scale of its dissemination in certain parts of the world, is a very troubling and important index of current levels of anti-Semitism. I would even venture to suggest that if we look at the history of the last century, the 20th century, we could find a close correspondence in many instances between uh, rising levels of anti-Semitism, particularly of the more deadly kind, and the popularity of the protocols of the other design. In other words, there is a close connection between this text and the wider uh, phenomenon of anti-Semitism and its mass appeal. I assume that most people in this room are aware of the bare facts regarding the protocols of the Elder Design, that this was essentially a document which we could say, safely say was a forgery with elements, strong elements of plagiarism, which emerged at the beginning of the 20th century in a very specific milieu in Tsarist Russia, the right-wing, radical, very anti-Semitic milieu. I won't go into the questions which do not need to concern us here at all about who exactly wrote the protocols, why they were written at that particular time. We had a discussion here in June at the Center when we invited Professor Cesare de Michaelis from Italy who discussed exactly those questions and we published his book about the non-existent manuscript which some of you may have seen on the table. So there's no need to elaborate that point again. But I think that the Russian origins, uh, the Tsarist Russian origins of the protocols, the fact that it came from a very distinct um, anti-Semitic media with a strong conspiratorial ideology and a belief that the Jews were a danger not only to the um, system of government and to society in Tsarist Russia, but to the whole world. One of the earliest versions of the protocols that brought to me, in fact was entitled in Russian, Enemies of the Human Race, and that was in 1906. Um, this is an important fact also for understanding its genesis in Japan, which I'm sure will be referred to later by uh, our speakers. The protocols are purported to be a Jewish document, or something written by Jews for Jews and exposed through devious ways, a secret document that supposedly reveals the way that Jews actually think. Almost like an x-ray into the uh, uh, Jewish mind 
and its um, uh, demonic lust for uh, domination. The, the protocols purport to lay out a plan of the Jewish conquest of the world. And in every country, in every culture where they have taken root, of course, there are some specific national characteristics of how that uh, plan of Jewish conquest is explained and why and to whom it appealed. And about that we will hear more tonight. But the question of Jewish power is one of the central issues that, um, that is obviously exposed in any discussion of the protocol. Another issue is the conditions in which the protocols appear to flourish and thrive. If we look at it historically over the 20th century as a whole, times of crisis, of severe strains and stresses in the society, periods of upheaval, convulsions, such as the First World War, obviously the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution in particular, subsequently the Great Depression and the crisis of the 1930s, World War II, in the post-war period we can think of uh, the Six-Day War and its effect uh, on uh, the Arab world, the Muslim, uh, more recently the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War, the fall of communism, all these major upheavals and crises seem to have provided a trigger or a catalyst for revised new versions of the protocol to emerge. And it would be interesting to examine the specific case of Japan also in the light of what I believe is such a universal pattern. There are questions involving um, the nature of the demonology of the Jews that is in, implicit in the protocols, what their sources are, and given the fact that in the case of Europe and Russia, uh, it is evident that the protocols build on a pre-existing tradition, not simply of prejudice, but of uh, demonization of the Jews, the medieval uh, portrayal of the Jews as uh, in league with Satan, as agents of the devil, as uh, antichrist, an apocalyptic vision of the negative and even di diabolical function of the Jews in history. If this indeed has strong medieval Christian roots, then the case of Japan becomes particularly interesting because such roots do not exist in Japan, although of course there are Christians in Japan and that too has importance in the current uh, uh, popularity of uh, or authorship of some of the works that relate to the protocols. And, and of course there is, there is the question of the Middle East, Israel, America, contemporary issues that we've discussed in other contexts here at the center. How do Japanese authors of the protocols, how do they see this text in the light of contemporary power relationships, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the Jews, the United States, and Israel? Those are only a few of the issues. Let me now um, pass to um, our speakers uh, today. Uh, this will necessarily make my introduction rather briefer than I, I had intended, but let, let me begin with, with, uh, with Professor Goodman. Um, Professor Goodman is um, Professor of Japanese and Comparative Literature at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the United States. And uh, he is uh, the author of uh, a number of works of which one in particular I have, I have read, they are very kindly producing it in time, um, the new paperback 
together with uh, Masanori Miyazawa, Jews in the Japanese Mind, The History and Uses of a Cultural Stereotype. And I think this was one of the first um, really important works that tries to come to terms also with the question of, of, of Japanese anti-Semitism. Thank you, Professor Westridge, and uh, thank you for the invitation to come to the uh, Sicilian Center. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here, and it's a great privilege to be on a panel with such distinguished colleagues, and uh, I'm honored to have this opportunity. Uh, the, uh, anybody who, any Jew who has been to Japan uh, has had a good time. Uh, Jews do not experience any particular uh, discrimination in Japan. If, if, if a Jew has uh, a bad ex has experiences any discrimination at all in Japan, it's likely to be because he's a foreigner and not because she's a Jew. Uh, and this has been historically the case. Generally speaking, uh, the Japanese have had very good relations with the Jews. Uh, there were there was a community of 20,000 plus Jewish refugees in Shanghai during the war, and the Japanese uh, protected them. Uh, they did not allow uh, the Germans to harm them, uh, and they lived the, the uh, Jewish refugees in Shanghai lived out the war in relative uh, comfort. They had a very rich cultural life. Um, uh, the when Japan regained its sovereignty in 1952 after the occupation, uh, it began to establish diplomatic relations with countries all over the world. It established re relations at that time with the State of Israel, and it has maintained good and unbroken relations with the State of Israel since that time. I would say good and even improving in, in recent years. Uh, so the question is, uh, you know, what's the, what are the protocols doing in Japan? And is it something that we should be concerned about? And why are the Japanese concerned about the Jews? Why why did they talk or think about the Jews at all uh, if, if relations are so good? And what are we doing here talking about this stuff? Uh, it's not particularly pleasant. And um, I'm sure we all have better things to do on a, on a pleasant, balmy October evening. So uh, why are we here? In the mid-1980s, numerous books based on the protocols of the Elder Design appeared in Japan and sold hundreds of thousands of copies into the millions. In 1987, I wrote an article in the Japanese monthly magazine Sekai criticizing this phenomenon and saying that the protocols are an incitement to murder. Norman Cohen, in his classic pioneering study, call the protocols a warrant for genocide. No less a figure of than Heinrich Himmler regarded the protocols as a model for the Nazis, and Hitler sought to emulate and improve upon the ruthless Jewish conspiracy that the protocols described. As Hannah Arendt has written, the protocols presented world conquest as a practical possibility, and implied that the whole affair was only a question of inspired or shrewd know-how, and that nobody stood in the way of a German victory over the entire world, but a patently small people, the Jews, who ruled it without possessing instruments of violence, an easy opponent, therefore, once their secret was discovered and their method emulated on a large scale. Uh, I'm, I have come to the position that this is the essence of the Protocols. It is not so much the fact that the Protocols is aimed at the Jews and that Jews have suffered catastrophically from it and continue to this day to be defamed by it. The essence of the Protocols is that it provides a rationale and an organizational model for committing mass murder that can be used by anybody, whether or not they know Jews, have a history of contact with Jews, or have a Jewish population living in their midst. 
What I want to do today is three things. First of all, I want to explain how the protocols came to, the, came to Japan. Secondly, I want to talk about how it has been used by a wide range of, of, of Japanese for diverse ideological reasons. And third, I want to, ex want to talk about how it predictably led to mass murder in Tokyo in March 1995. I want to make it clear that this is by no means an indictment of Japan, but a discussion of one subject in, within Japanese history. Okay, I want to do this as quickly as possible because my, uh, my time is limited. Uh, the protocol came to Japan in, in, in about 1920. The Japanese sent a force that eventually reached uh, about 72,000 troops into Siberia uh, as part of what's called the Siberian Intervention along with troops from the United States, Canada, Czechoslovakia, and other nations, in an attempt to reverse uh, the Russian Revolution. While the Japanese troops were in Siberia, they came into contact with white Russian troops who, who were, had been issued uh, copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion as an explanation for why the Russian Revolution had taken place and why it was so difficult uh, to reverse it. Uh, those Russian, those those soldiers who had been soldiers and other scholars uh, who were attached to the to the Japanese forces uh, brought those copies of the protocols back to Japan, and uh, that's how they reached Japan. Uh, there's a there's a long and very interesting story about uh, about the reception of the protocols, but tonight we don't have time to go into that. Maybe during a question and answer session, or maybe. Uh, my two colleagues will be able to comment on it. In 1920, a partial version called The Jewish Carol was published by a man named Shinichi Tsiyanosuke, who had been a Russian language instructor uh, in, in uh, Siberia. He had been trained at the Nikolai Seminary, uh, a Russian Orthodox seminary. And in 1924, the first uh, full translation was uh, published under the title Behind the World Revolution. Uh, during World War II, there were two trends, and I think this is uh, this is an interesting uh, and telling aspect of the story. Um, domestically speaking, uh, the protocols were used in Japan as a way to uh, to control dissent and to ideologically, uh, as part of the ideological war on the home front. Uh, and Hirokawa Daichi, who is a very well-known, uh, liberal, very well-respected historian, uh, recalls in his autobiography, writing uh, the, the following entry. Stalin, John Kaishek, Roosevelt, and Churchill are all puppets of international jewelry. The roots of their strategy lie in secret Jewish organizations of Jewish military industrialists, international businessmen, finance capitalists, and members of secret societies, speculators and the like. Hitler and the Nazis are the saviors of mankind or combating them. Japan has also been victimized by the Jews who initiated the present war. Any Japanese with an ounce of sense knows that we are not the imperialists. Uh, similarly, uh, another Japanese historian, Saito Takashi, uh, recalled, during the war, all the knowledge we had about Europe and America was what we could glean from our Western history and world geography textbooks, books describing the Jewish global conspiracy and the Masonic threat were available, and our knowledge was so poor that we readily believed the theories they presented. So domestically, this was taught, it was common knowledge uh, that the Jews uh, controlled the world, that the war was caused by the Jews, that there was an international Jewish conspiracy. At the same time, the protocols uh, internationally were, had a completely different effect. And uh, another man, Inuzuka Kodashige, uh, who was uh, very learned in, and a well-known authority in the protocol, wrote on the protocols, 
uh, wrote what we today would, would consider anti-Semitic uh, literature was a Navy officer, a Navy captain, who was placed in charge of uh, the, the refugees in Shanghai because of his uh, supposed expertise on the Jews. Uh, but he read the protocols as a philo-Semitic text. Uh, that is, he said, you know, these, these are very powerful, the Jews are a very powerful people. Uh, they have immense resources at their command. And what, uh, we, what we, as the Japanese Empire, have to do is to harness this Jewish power and use it for the benefit of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the Japanese Empire. After the war, Inuzuka claimed that he was a, a friend of the Jews, and he used the evidence of his uh, uh, of writer, his professor Shalomi knows this story better than I do and can perhaps tell it, um, um, but used, used his uh, record of uh, treating the Jews well in Shanghai uh, and, his, um, and his belief in Jewish power and uh, and in the uh, status of the Jewish community uh, to prove that he was a friend of the Jews. And he became the head, the president of the Japan-Israel uh, Friendship Society, and he remained in that position until his death in 1965. So there are these two sides to the protocols. Um, the upshot, however, is that the protocols were a part of Japanese culture. They, they have been in Japan and have been circulating in Japan as long as they have been circulating in the English-speaking uh, world. Um, they're well known, there are many different editions, and, um, and they're available. In the post-war period, uh, as the Japanese tried to put their, the, the, war, the war behind them, um, they also put the, the protocols behind them. And so the protocols enter a period of dormancy. But in the 1980s, all of a sudden, they began to appear again. And what I want to do uh, next is, is talk about, offer four portraits uh, of four people, four different people, from four completely different backgrounds, who actively used the, the protocol. Uh, the first is Uno Masani, and I'll call him uh, a Christian fundamentalist xenophobe. The second is a man named Yaji Makinji, who I will label a frustrated academic. Uh, maybe there are others like that in this room. <laughs> uh, Ota Yu is a left-wing ideologue, and Asahara Shoko, uh, I will call, uh, and I think you'll agree with me, was a religious fanatic. So these are the four people I want to talk about. Uh, Uno um, was the author who was the first to really spectacularly resurrect the protocols in the mid-1980s. Uh, in 1986, he published two books that became bestsellers that sold, at the time, uh, a combined total of more than a million copies. Uno resurrected and refurbished Japan's xenophobic ethnic nationalism, arguing that Japan had, fa had faced a mortal threat from the adherence of an alien occult religion and identifying that threat with the, Je with the Jews. Uno explained that the trade friction that was going on at the time with the United States uh, uh, was the result of the fact that America was controlled by a secret all-powerful Jewish shadow government. Japanese-Jewish relations were, in fact, Japanese-Jewish relations, according to Uno. Indeed, as he trumpeted in the title of one of his 1986 bestsellers, if you understand the Jews, you will understand the world. Furthermore, because they had been mandated by the American-drafted post-war constitution, all of Japan's democratic institutions were nothing more than agencies of the Jewish plot to destroy Japan. Democracy and internationalism were simply the Judaization of Japan, and in response to the Jewish threat, Uno urged his countrymen to emulate Adolf Hitler and devise policies that would protect the interests of the Japanese ethnic nation. 
the means of Nadia is the Japanese script. Christian theology also played a role in Bruno's thought. She's a fundamentalist uh, Christian minister in the work of the Bible Christian Church, and he had previously published uh, explicit works of Christian prophecy. In these works, he preached that the ultimate aim of the Jews was to precipitate World War III in order to bring about the Messianic Age. As foretold by the prophet Ezekiel, a Soviet... I, I'm not making this up. Uh, as foretold by the prophet Ezekiel, a Soviet invasion of Israel would precipitate the war, which the Jews, you'll be happy to know, would win. Uh, a Jewish autocrat would be anointed and benevolently, benevolently rule the world from the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Uh, but the Jewish dictatorship would only last three and a half years, after which the real Messiah, the resurrected Jesus Christ, would appear uh, on, on the Mount of Olives, right here, uh, and usher in the true millennium. Una's argument closely resembles the apocalyptic theology of the American premillennialist theologian uh, Hal Lindsey, and it seems likely that uh, Una was aware of Lindsey, whose immensely popular The Late Great Planet Earth was published in 1970 and had reportedly sold 18 million copies uh, by the mid-1980s when Una was, was writing himself. The cataclysm Uno predicts is identical to the one Lindsay describes and uses the same uh, as exegetical e evidence. Uno, Uno Masami's achievement is to have combined Japan's indigenous xenophobia and ethnic nationalism with current trends in Christian fundamentalism in a conspiracy theory that derived from the protocols of the elders of Zion. In so doing, he achieved both financial success and respectability. His books were advertised prominently in all of Japan's major newspapers. He was quoted in news articles about the Japanese economy, and he was invited by a conservative faction of, the Jap of Japan's ruling Liberal Democratic Party to speak to a Constitution Day rally in May 1987. Not only did Uno's success embolden others to follow his example, but his notoriety made the Protocols of the Elders of Zion and its theory of Jewish conspiracy uh, to, to destroy Japan and rule the world common knowledge in Japan. Yajima Kinji uh, is my next uh, subject. It's often argued, especially in our post-9-11 world, that feelings of humiliation go far to explain the ideology of terrorism. In the Japanese case, feelings of frustration and humiliation do serve as a justification for the, for the turn of some Japanese intellectuals to the theories of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, and I think Yajima Kinji is an example of this trend. He is a very, he was a very prominent Japanese academic. Uh, he taught at uh, a number of very prestigious in, institutions, including Tokyo Gakugei University, Tokyo Institute of Technology, Aoyama Gakuin University, and even taught at Beijing University as an exchange <coughs> professor. Yajimo was also a well-respected uh, uh, scholar and translator. He translated the works of the important Austrian economist Friedrich Hayek and uh, was an editor of Hayek's works. In 1979, he translated the very important book uh, by John Rawls, the liberal philosopher, A Theory of Justice. This is uh, one of the most influential liberal texts, philosophical texts, uh, in the post-war period. As a reliable expert on economic affairs, Yajima was quoted <coughs> twice in 1987 by uh, Time magazine. Notwithstanding his academic credentials, in 1986, Yajima published The Expert Way to Read the Jewish Protocols, which you see here on the screen. And by 1987, the book was already in its 55th printing. Uh, according to Amazon.com in Japan, if you want the book, you can order it and it will be delivered. You'll be happy to know uh, in two business days. Uh, in the introduction to The Expert Way, Yajima traces his fascination with the protocols to his experience in the United States in 1972 when he visited during the uh, Nixon -govern McGovern presidential campaign. Uh, he writes that he was invited to participate in a panel 
to discuss trade friction between the United States and Japan. Uh, but when he read the coverage uh, of the event in the Sacramento Chronicle the next day, he was deeply offended uh, by the way the paper described him. Uh, afterwards, he moved from Sacramento to San Francisco, where he visited the Bohemian Club, an exclusive men's club, and there he began to become convinced that the world was not run as seemed apparent by uh, institutions uh, and governments, but he, he decided that it, it was really run behind the scenes by secret societies of rich and powerful men. In the clandestine reaches of secret groups like the Bohemian Club, individuals, business enterprises, and political parties uh, that uh, appear on the surface to be opposed are in fact working in concert. For the Ajima, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion was the manual or the Bible, the details, the consensus strategy uh, of these powerful forces that control the world. Uh, the was not a stupid man. He understood very well that uh, that the Protocols was a forgery, uh, but he he accepted this and said, uh, I, I'll quote, I think the Protocols is a forgery. But the Jews are the only ones capable of the particular concrete expression in the protocol regarding ideology, politics, economics, and religion. Consequently, the protocols were either written by someone more familiar with the Jews uh, than the Jews themselves, or, if that is not the case, then it was put together from the results of all the research ever done on the Jews. In either case, there is no doubt the content consists of the wisdom of the Jews. This is, a, this is an argument that, uh, that, that Adolf Hitler also made, so it's... Uh, uh, I think ultimately, Yajima's expert way to read the Jewish protocol is a response to the sense of humiliation and frustration and the inferiority and com complex engendered by his encounter with the United States. Despite his top scholarly achievements, uh, the world remained quite opaque to Yajima until he discovered the protocols of the Elders of Zion, which gave him a, a simple explanation, which was a convincing explanation of what was really going on beneath the surface. The protocols helped to salve his bruised ego by revealing that he was the victim of, the, of a racist conspiracy uh, that was, was at the root of world politics. Both of you, I would categorize as a new left ideologue, if, if uh, uh, Yajima is uh, a centrist, is a liberal, classical liberal, uh, Ota is very definitely a member of, of the right. The German sociologist August Bebel coined, socialist uh, August Bebel coined the phrase the socialism of fools. Uh, to describe the activities of those who blame Jews for the world's ills instead of the real culture of capitalism. Uh, Bebel would have applied the phrase to Ota, whose career reflects the steady degeneration of the Japanese left in the wo world in the years uh, since World War II. Uh, I'll, I'll go through this very quickly. Ota was born in 1930. He joined the Japanese Communist Party in 1947. In the wake of Khrushchev's revelations of Stalin's crimes in 1956, he left the party and founded the Trotskyist League of Japan, which was the immediate forerunner of the League of Revolutionary Communists, Kakyodo, uh, which is uh, uh, a very important organization. Uh, which uh, Ota founded uh, with several other people in, 1950, in December of 1957. Kakyodo was the immediate forerunner of the two most important new left sects of the 1960s, uh, Kaku, uh, Kakumaru and uh, Chukaku, which in the late 1960s and the early 1970s engaged in internecine warfare known in Japanese as Uchigewa which resulted in hundreds of violent clashes annually and caused numerous deaths and injuries. 
This sectarian warfare disguised, uh, disgusted the Japanese public and contributed importantly, I think, to the, to the general loss of sympathy for the left in Japan in the 1970s and, and beyond. Uh, calling himself a pure Trotskyist in Japan, Japanese Junto, Ota left Takyodo in July 1958, and in the, in the 1960s he was a very active uh, uh, ideologue. Um, but as in, in the 1970s, as the fortunes of the Japanese left began to wane, he moved on to other causes. Uh, for one thing, he, he championed the revolution for Japan's indigenous Ainu minority. Uh, and then he turned to e uh, calling for an ecological uh, revolution and became very, very active in the ecology movement. He promoted what he called Tenji no Gaku, which demands the repentance of the human race uh, for despoiling the environment. He calls humans the enemies of the earth and calls for peaceful coexistence of all species throughout the universe. Uh, certainly a sentiment that I don't think anybody here would disagree with. Um, uh, he also had uh, parliamentary ambitions, and in 1990 he ran unsuccessfully for a seat in the lower house uh, of the Japanese diet. Ota is a prolific author, and if you look his name up on Amazon or on the Kinokuniya book web, uh, you will find uh, about 80 titles attributed to him. Uh, either as the author or, or translator. Uh, before 1991, Ota's books focused primarily on Marxist theory uh, and to a certain extent on, on ecological issues. After 1991, he turned his attention to the occult and the Jews. In 1991, he published The Principle of UFOs and Celestial Civilization, uh, his first book about the Jews, also published in 1991, was The Global Strategy of the Seven Great Jewish Cartels. In, uh, and, and since that time, since 1991, uh, Ota has published at least uh, one book a year uh, with the word Judea in the title, and many more volumes of conspiracy theory uh, that deal with the Jewish threat. Uh, this is an example uh, which uh, says that the Jewish conspiracy to invade Japan. The Jewish invasion of Japan goes back 450 years to the middle of the 16th century. In another instance, he, he claims that the Jewish invasion of Japan has been going on since the Nara period, that is, since the 8th uh, century, so you can, you can take your pick. Uh, helpfully, Ota has also trans produced numerous translations, including in 2003, Martin Luther's classic anti-Semitic text, uh, The Jews and Their Lies. He's also uh, translated the works of American conspiracy theorists and anti-Semites Eustace Mullins and John Coleman. <coughs> Ota has also experimented with electoral politics, having founded the Society for Global uh, Restoration, uh, which which is Chiu Ijinkai, uh, which I surmise is identical to the Global Restoration Party, Chiu Ijin To, which fielded candidates in the 1992 uh, Upper Diet House, Upper House Diet election, on a platform opposing, quote, the ambitions of the Jews, Pharisees, to conquer the world and turn it into a global pasture for the human race. Uh, although the Global Restoration Party polled only 11,883 votes, or a minuscule 0.03% of the electorate, it was the first time since 1942 that a candidate for public office had run uh, in Japan on an overtly anti-Jewish uh, platform. Uh, this is a poster that also appeared in 1992, not for uh, Ota's party, but for a, a similar group called the uh, uh, League of National Socialists. And you can see um, above the letters NSADP, uh, NSDAP is the phrase um, protect the environment. And so you have this sort of morphing of 
ecological politics uh, into anti-Semitic politics. And this is just a, that there, there's just a sort of general degeneration of left-wing politics from a kind of Stalinist, orthodox, uh, communist position through the new left uh, into a whole melange of different uh, uh, causes and ending up with this uh, this this politics based on the politics uh, on the uh, uh, what we call the Beelzebub design, and and uh, Ota is not alone in this. Another figure is Hirose Takashi. And I'm sorry that this is not clear, but this is a chart published in, in a quite respectable uh, twice monthly magazine called Sapio, which which uh, purports to explain how the Roth, Rothschilds uh, control everything uh, in the world: the media, the military, uh, governments, and politics. Uh, Hirose is a man with uh, impeccable left-wing credentials. He's also the editor of a book uh, titled uh, The Jews, Merchants of Diamonds and Death. Uh, so this is, this is not, uh, Ota is not uh, sui generis. He's, there, there are plenty like him. Uh, finally, Asahara Shoko. Uh, is my religious fanatic. As you can see by what by the foregoing, by the by the mid 1980s, the protocols of the Elders of Zion and the theory of an international Jewish conspiracy to destroy Japan and and uh, control the world had been popularized in Japan. Many people had written about it. Uh, it, was, it was basically common knowledge. And its central contention, um, contentions were, were widely circulated, they were available in best-selling books, they were available in, 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 in periodicals with large circulations, they appeared in large, gaudy advertisements in daily newspapers with circulations of 9 or 10 million copies a day. A political party had been formed and candidates had run, for office on a platform drawn from the protocols. The protocols conflation of Jews and Freemasons, the calumny that Jews control the media and manipulate world governments, uh, was frequently, these were frequently repeated, and the identification of the United States as a Jewish nation was widely disseminated and to some extent believed. <coughs> Into this milieu appeared Asahara Shoko. Born Masumoto Chizuo in Kumamoto in 1955, Asahara was legally blind from birth. But having partial sight in one eye, he nevertheless had an advantage over the completely unsighted pupils at the schools for the blind to which he was sent, and he had high intellectual aspiration. Um, after failing it once, he moved to Tokyo in 1977 to try a second time also unsuccessfully, to pass the entrance examination uh, for Tokyo University. He was always interested in the occult, and he, had, he joined uh, Agonshu, a neo-Buddhist sect, in 1981. In 1982, he was convicted of selling herbal medicines without a license. In 1984, he founded Om Shinsen no Kai, the Om Mountain Hermit Society, the forerunner of Om Shinri Kyo, the Om Supreme Truth sect. Asahara's transformation from a simple charlatan to a megalomaniacal guru came in 1985, when he claimed to have received the vision that defined his mission. In January 1986, he made a short trip to India and announced on his return that while in India, he had achieved enlightenment. Uh, should always be so. In 1987, he changed the name of his sect to Om Shinri Kyo, and in 1989, it was recognized as a tax exempt religious corporation by the Japanese government. Asahara immediately began his quest to achieve salvation through a world encompassing apocalypse. In 1989, he published From Annihilation to Emptiness, Mesubo Karakokue. The book as journalist, uh, 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 I'm sorry, um, and in, in 19, I'm sorry, he published the book in 1989. 
In February 1990, he stood for election uh, to the lower house of the Diet. Uh, but like Old Davieu, who ran in the same election, he was disastrously defeated, uh, polling only 1,783 votes. Uh, Stymied at the polls, Asahara de devised other ways to implement his plans and hosted an Armageddon seminar on Ishigaki Island in the Ryukyu chain in April to begin acting out his apocalyptic vision. Ohm began experimenting with weapons of mass destruction the same month by launching an unsuccessful botulism attack in Tokyo. Two years later, Asahara and members of the Ohm leadership visited Zaire in Africa in an attempt to acquire the Ebola virus. In 1993, Ohm began the large-scale production of sarin nerve gas and acquired an army surplus helicopter in Russia presumably to use as a, as a delivery vehicle. In June 20, on June 27, 1994, Ohm released poison sarin gas from a truck in Matsumoto, a city west of Tokyo, and this was, as Robert Lipton has pointed out, the first large-scale non-military use of nerve gas anywhere on Earth. Seven people were killed and hundreds injured. Then on March 20, 20th, 1995, members of OM released sarin gas on the Tokyo subway system, killing 12 people and injuring more than 5,000 others. In Asahara's paranoid view, OM was merely responding to, in kind, to the diabolical threat posed by a global conspiracy out to destroy the sect. The overarching theme coloring Asahara's entire view of the world, the scholar Ian Reeder explains, was the notion that a vast conspiracy bent on world domination was seeking to destroy Ohm as part of its fiendish plan. Ohm was the only force left standing between the conspirators, who included the United States and Japanese governments, the Freemasons, the Jews, and numerous others, and their evil intentions. This concatenation of Freemasons, Jews, and world governments in a global conspiracy had no other source in Japan other than the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Three months before its attack on the Tokyo subway, Ohm made its indebtedness to the Protocols even more explicit. The January 1995 issue of Vajrayana Sarka, which you see on the screen, its organ publication featured a 95-page manual of fear that quoted liberally and at length from the protocols and officially declared war on, on, the, on the Jewish world shadow government, which it asserted was plotting to, quote, murder untold numbers of people and brainwash and control the rest. Despite its rhetoric, Ohm was not concerned with Jews per se, however. Rather, it tar targeted, this is, the, uh, this is the declaration of war, by the way. Despite its rhetoric, Ohm was not concerned with Jews per se. Rather, it targeted the Japanese elite, whom they defined as Freemasons, and therefore as Jews. And in the manual of fear, you have this rogues list. Uh, these are the most, some of the most prominent people in Japan. Uh, this is the emperor, uh, the empress, the empress's father, um, uh, and and uh, and others. In other words, this is the inter the international elite. Uh, Ohm's gassing of the Tokyo subway in the international center of quote-unquote Jewish power in Tokyo was in its own way uh, a logical uh, consequence of its, of its view of the world. And this is, uh, this is the aftermath. Um, 
I think that there's a direct line, in other words, between uh, the spread of the protocol, its popularity in Japan, and this incident of mass murder. Uh, today we uh, live in a world where uh, it is no longer uh, primarily uh, governments and states uh, which threaten terrorism. Now, that's not to minimize uh, the threat of, uh, of, of state terrorism. Uh, but I think that the, that the really scary threat is uh, from fringe groups who are armed with a homicidal ideology and weapons of mass destruction. And the first really successful such uh, incident uh, was this uh, gassing of the Tokyo subway in March 1995 by the own uh, Supreme through the sect. So I think the Japanese example is instructive in a larger sense. It, su it suggests that real-world experience with Jews or involvement with real political controversies like the Arab-Israeli conflict are not required for people to be seduced by the protocols or to discover in it a motive and means to commit violence. Like the Communist Manifesto, the protocols is available in the world environment and people in any culture, regardless of their knowledge or experience of Jews, can, and I regret to say probably will, use it. Thank you. Uh, my parents were born in Poland, and then I think I published a poem, uh, I certainly did this. Uh, my mother tongue. How one moves from Poland to Japan is, of course, another question. But I think that uh, Professor Benami deserves um, a medal, not least for the fact that he has been teaching at this university um, since, if this is to be believed, since 1971, which means 33 years, which could be a world record. I don't, I don't know. But it's certainly an impressive achievement, and we certainly know as well that his lectures are immensely popular, probably the biggest part of the Hebrew University come to listen to him on Japan, which is a very interesting fact about the Hebrew University, that his subject um, has such, such resonance, and I'm sure that owes something uh, to his endeavors. Um, I myself learned a great deal from reading his book on the Japanese and the Jews, and uh, it's only one of a number of works I'll just mention um, two. One about politics and culture in wartime Japan, which was published by the OUP, and um, more recently in Japanese. Did you actually write this in Japanese? You wrote in English, but it appears only in Japanese? The title is Aha Naru Tenno. Aha Naru Tenno, for those of you who don't understand Japanese, is the emperor as mother figure. And that is very intriguing. Tokyo, 2003. And I should also mention that um, at the turn of the millennium, or shortly after, in November 2000, the emperor of Japan bestowed on and I made the order of the sacred treasure, gold and silver star. Well, that's something. So, please. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, David Goodman, for your illuminating <coughs> presentation. Now, much of the discussion about the protocols has been devoted to the question of their authenticity whether it's a forged document, and time and again, people have been showing that it's a forged document, and therefore invalid. But it seems that the question of their authenticity, especially in Japan, probably in other countries of East Asia too, does not bother the people very much. So even if we prove that it's a forgery, they say, okay, it may be a forgery, but it really reflects what the Jews want to do and what they are doing in the world. And that's why we don't care whether 
it's a true document or a forgery. If so, why are they so popular in the world and as we just heard in East Asia? Because they offer a very simple and seemingly convincing explanation to a very complicated world for very unsophisticated people who are quite tired for the very sophisticated explanations that we give them about what happens in the world. And here is something very simple. There is a group which controls the world, which wants to gain more power, more riches. So it's part of the conspiracy theories that we find in the world. And it's not only about the Jews. You know, the world is full of conspiracy theories, of plot theories. It's very simple, it's very convenient, it's very... Um, very... Uh, useful for many people to use conspiracy theories to explain very complicated international and economic and social situations. Now, the, the tendency to believe in these conspiracies or plots grows when there is some sort of a small, strange group that is a little bit hidden but very influential. So the Jews as such a group, but not only the Jews, we just heard about the Freemasons. Quite often, especially in Japan, when they speak about the Jews, the Jews and the Freemasons, because both are sort of strange groups that who knows what they are plotting, and the, uh, what they are thinking. Now, such theories, especially about the Jewish plot to rule the world, became very popular in the West in the Christian West, in Europe, United States, where there are deep religious anti-Semitic roots in Christianity. There are deep social roots in friction, social friction with Jews. There are deep economic roots of economic competition and sometimes even political roots of you know, anti-Semitic parties. But in Japan, all these roots do not exist. There is no religious root to Japanese anti-Semitism. The Japanese cannot tell the difference between Jews and Christians. And from the Japanese perspective, uh, Japanese distance, the Jews and the Christians are uh, believers in more than the same religion. And, uh, we can laugh at it and say how stupid they are, they don't understand. But is it really so stupid? I mean, from the Japanese point of view, who go that far as Japan, Judah and Christianity are actually one religion, because they believe in the same God, in the same Old Testament. The differences between Judah and Christianity that we think are so important are smaller than the differences between some Buddhist sects in Japan. There are some Buddhist sects, like Zen, you could say, and uh, Shinshu, Buddhism, that are more different from each other than Judaism and Christianity. Instead, we call them Buddhism. So, it's not that strange and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, stupid on the part of the Japanese to regard Judaism and Christianity as the same religion. So, there are no religious uh, groups, except for Christians, but you know, Christians are a very small group in Japan. And the anti Semitic people within the Christians are, again, a very small minority. And of course, no social no social rules. There was never social friction between Japanese and Jews. And as Professor Goodman just explained, Jews were never molested in Japan, never attacked in Japan. I mean, personally, even during World War II, you know, there were Jews in Japan. There were Jewish musicians performing in Japan. There were Jewish students in Japanese universities. They came from Manchuria, but still, they were Jewish. The Japanese never heard them. I mean, these were foreigners. And if they carried, let's say, German passports, some of these uh, musicians, they were German citizens, they came to Japan as Germans. But then the German government abolished the uh, German citizenship, but the Japanese did not accept it. They said they came to us as, as Germans, we should treat them as Germans. They didn't care about them being Jewish. So, no social friction with Jews, no economic friction with Jews. I mean, there's no Jewish minority in Japan, there's no competition between Jews and Japanese. You know, Jews were foreigners, Western foreigners in Japan. And of course, no political rules. 
And even the very definition of a Jew in Japan is very problematic, but it's problematic too here. In Japan, I mean, who is a Jew for a Japanese? How does a Japanese define a Jew? It's very difficult for him to define. Jewish or Westerner, um, many Japanese would say that any rich and smart Westerner is a Jew. <laughs> but that's what's Jewish, being a Jew means that you're rich, you're smart, you're influential. So, if he happens to carry a cross, it doesn't matter for the Japanese. He is a Jew. Um, <coughs> in Japan, the Jews were regarded not only as Westerners, but as very peculiar Westerners. But not the Jews that they confronted personally. It was an idea, sort of a very general idea, that there is such a group in the West called the Jews. They dominate the West. Now, and these Jews are actually the ep epitome of the West. The most Western side of the West. Which means that everything that the Japanese admired in the West, that the Jews represented everything that the Japanese admired in the West, but also everything that they hated in the West. And the Jews reflected both. For instance, the Japanese admired, and they still admire, many, many things in the West. They admire the riches of the West. The Jews are super rich. They admire the intelligence of the West, the scholarship of the West. So the Jews are super intelligent, super uh, learned. So, I would say, Rothschild and Einstein. We just have the Rothschild. These are the, the typical Jews of the Japanese. And also, one can say, uh, Kissinger, because he was influential, he was strong. Uh, but also, the Jews are, uh, the Jews reflect the bad things of the West, or that the Japanese hate and fear in the West. Like, for instance, the greed of the West, materialism of the West. So the Jews are also very materialistic, only interested in money. Only, so when the Japanese say Jewish, it means something materialistic, greedy, also deceit. The Jews are crafty, they are not very honest, their practices are inhonest, because that's what they think about the West. And the Jews are the, let's say, caricature of the West, or the uh, epitome of the West, of the Japanese. The Japanese accepted anti-Semitism as a theory, together with all Western theories. There's hardly any Western theory that was not accepted in Japan, either by most Japanese or by few Japanese. The Japanese were very eager to accept any theory that they found in the West. And anti-Semitism in the late 19th century, 20th century, was part of Western civilization. So when the Japanese adopted Western civilization, they also adopted anti-Semitism. They adopted Shakespeare, they adopted the Merchant of Venice. It went together. So it reached Japan, it uh, struck roots in Japan, but because there, were no, there was no there were no deep religious, or there were no religious, or social, or economic roots for this anti-Semitism. It all remained on a very sort of intellectual level, as a literary genre. And not only that, it was also interpreted in a different way than in the West. So if we take again the protocols, in the West it's a sinister uh, book. It is a part of Jews hatred. It, it, it uh, produces hatred for Jews. I mean, it stems from hatred for Jews and it produces hatred for Jews. So those who read them and who believe them become haters of Jews. I mean, this is something that we all believe and we all accept. But it was not so in Japan. In Japan, this anti-Semitic literature that showed the Jews that they dominate the world, that they at least try to dominate the world, Made many people admire the Jews. They're so rich, so smart, so crafty, and they probably are dominating the world, are going to dominate the world. Maybe we should befriend them. Maybe we should learn from them. Maybe we should join forces with them. 
So all these so-called experts from the Jews, that we just heard about them, Yasu and Zuka and others, on the one hand, they promoted this anti-Semitic literature. They translated parts of the protocol. They believed in the protocol. On the other hand, they recommended friendship to the Jews. So they took anti-Semitic assumptions and drew out pious-Semitic conclusions. A phenomenon that we hardly find in the West, or maybe don't find in the West at all. And uh, some people would say they are, it was immoral for them, or that sort of moral duplicity in being both anti-Semitic and philo-Semitic. How can you be both anti-Semitic and philo-Semitic? Japanese so-called anti-Semitic writers have proven that you can be, at least in Japan, there's no contradiction of being anti-Semitic and philo-Semitic. You can play with these things. You know, person like Yasue, who was an expert on the Jews, who visited Palestine in the 1920s, he visited the Hebrew University, and he wrote how beautiful it all is and how nice it is. And he had a lot of admiration for the Jews. But then, of course, it's part of the Jewish power, part of Jewish influence in the world. Not only that, but this belief in the protocols, this belief in the protocols made the Japanese save the Jews, which is also very strange. I mean, the Japanese saved the Jews in World War II because they believed in Hitler's anti-Semitism. Because Hitler said that the Jews control both the West, I mean, capital states and communist world, and uh, but when Hitler said that, he meant that he should kill the Jews. Now, those people in Japan who believe Hitler, that the Jews control the world, their conclusion was just the opposite. That Hitler is stupid. Because if the Jews are so strong and so powerful, you should not go against them. You should join them. You should control the world through them, not against them. So, the Japanese, in World War II, saved thousands of Jewish lives. In Shanghai, as we have heard, of course, and other places, not because they liked the Jews, not because they were very humane toward the Jews. You know, there is now some literature about the old and all the Sugihara thing, you know, how this person was humane there. But it was not something that Sugihara did. This is the policy of the Japanese government. And the policy was to allow the Jews enter Japanese controlled territories, even enter Japan, in order to use their power. They believed that these people have a lot of power and Japan should use this power for its own benefit. Now, I brought here the protocols of the elders of Zion in Japanese. And so we speak so much about it, maybe you would like to have a look at it. So, this is how it looks. It is called the uh, Udaya Gitesho. And but it's called in Japanese Kurigana, which means how to read it actually. So Gitesho means protocols. But in Kurigana, this protocol, you know, the book, make believe it's protocol. It's, it has both the Japanese version and the Russian version of the Sergei Milus. It was trans, it is a translation um, by Kubota Eiji. It was translated in 1938 by Kubota Eiji. It was first published. It was published. This is the second edition in 1940. It was. Uh, republished in 1959, and this is 1973 printing, the seventh printing, so it went until 1973 into seven printings. Now, when you open the book, first you see photographs. Now, who, are this, who is in these photographs? At first we see royalty, British and other European royalty, kings, and it says, these kings, European kings, and it starts as uh, uh, with uh, Edward VII, the first photograph, one whole page of Edward VII, and it said all of these are Freemasons. So it didn't say they are Jews, they are Freemasons. So again, you see, Jews and Freemasons are the same. And then it has a picture of nine American presidents. All of these are Freemasons. So, you say Jewish block? Maybe because it's a Freemason block, right? Uh, European kings and American presidents are all Freemasons. Then it has pictures of prominent Jews. 
And who are the prominent Jews? Of course, Rosh. But there's Einstein, there's Trotsky, and uh, there's Columbus, <laughs> and there is President Roosevelt. <laughs> All of these are Jews. Now, does this mean that the Jews are bad? Maybe, because you know, Roosevelt was there. And Einstein was very much admired in Japan. And no Japanese ever had a bad opinion of Einstein. Columbus, maybe because he tried to conquer or at least uh, he, he produced this letter continent of the American uh, continent. But the most interesting picture is here. It shows a group of Jews raising their fists. And it says, a group of Jewish uh, patriots, let me say, or Giyuhe, or militia, or brave young people, protesting the, um, um, protesting Hitler's brutalities. Mm -hmm. And it says, protesting Hitler's brutalities in 19... 38, I'm not sure whether the pictures were in 1938 edition or 1994 edition, but anyway, it's one of the editions, at least in the 1959 edition, showing Jewish patriots protesting Hitler's brutalities. I wouldn't say this is an anti Semitic picture, right? It uses brutalities. Now, how did this book come to my possession? It's a very interesting story. I don't know. So you think he went to buy the protocol, so I did buy it. But in 1959, sorry, in 1978, a group of Japanese businessmen came to visit the Hebrew University, headed by a businessman called Nishiyama, and uh, they very much were impressed. I mean, it was the first time in Israel they went and visited factories in Kibbutz, and then they came to the university, and they had a little party for them. And then Mr. Nishiyama rose up and said, We want to thank you for all your hospitality. And we saw how beautiful Israel is, and what great miracles you have done in Israel. We admire you very much. We didn't know anything about the Jews, we didn't know anything about Israel before we came here. So we thought we'd buy some books and we'd read them on the plane. <laughs> Someone recommended to us this book. We read it on the plane and we found how true it is. <laughs> when we came to Israel, we saw everything that was written in the book is true. Now we admire you even more. <laughs> and he said, Now I want to leave this book with you as a present, to sign his name, dedication, and he gave it to me. So, here you see a Japanese businessman today, what he thinks about the, the protocols of Elder Society. Now, this is not only this book. Here I brought another book called Judaia no Shoho, Jewish Business Practices. Sounds very anti Semitic, right? And uh, the also, Fujita Den, very successful Japanese businessman, he passed away recently. Uh, he established uh, McDonald's Japan. Now, who? if you were in Japan, you see how successful McDonald's is in Japan. So he became very rich. And he thought he should tell the Japanese people about Jewish business practices. And he writes about the greed and greediness of the Jews, and how the Jews sometimes cheat, and how the Jews are materialistic, and how they, what they say is not always so trustworthy. So, you would say, this is anti-Semitic literature, right? Because that's what anti-Semitic has been saying all the way. But, Mr. Fujita then says, these are the practices that I recommend to the Japanese. <laughs> he said, in this hostile world of today, if you want to survive, you should be like the Jews. This is the only way of international economic success. But you know, there were some Jews who said, but still you are anti-Semitic, because this is how we describe the Jews. He said, I regard myself as a Jew, because this is the way I've been practicing. That's why I became so rich. And there is a chapter in, in this book about himself. And he calls himself Ginza no Yudayajin. I am a Jew of the Ginza in Tokyo. So, is this anti Semitic literature? On the one hand, yes, because it shows the Jews in such a bad way. On the other hand, no. Great admiration for the Jews, and he uh, recommends it to the Japanese. Now, even if you, if you take uh, Uno Masan, the great anti Semitic writer that was a woman just mentioned, this Uno person, Uno Masami, wherever he's accused of being anti-Semitic, he says, no, I admire the Jews, 
I admire Israel, I love Israel, and when people really know us, but the suspicious say, oh, does he say so? How do you have? Then he produces a photograph. Photograph is Menachem Begin. He came to Israel, somehow went to a party where Menachem Begin was there. There was a photographer, and has to be photographed with Begin. And he says, I admire this person, he's my mother, Menachem Begin. So, of course, he's anti Semitic, but from what he is writing, on the other hand, you can say he's not exactly anti Semitic. And of course, as Professor Goodman has mentioned, that from time to time there are sort of states of anti Semitic literature in Japan. And this is whenever Japan is in confrontation with the United States. It was in World War II, it was the 1980s during the uh, trade friction with the United States. Now, why do these uh, periods produce anti Semitic literature? Because from the Japanese point of view, it's not logical that the United States should be against Japan. Because they think if we are so good and so nice, why should the Americans be against us? So they need some explanation. Here can say the explanation says no, it's not the Americans. It's the Jews behind the Americans. If you look at the Japanese wartime press, quite often it says it's not a war between Japan and the United States. It's a war between Japan and the Jews. So there's some very uh, strange Jews in the United States who pull the rings. And in Japan today too, whenever there is such a way there is anti Semitic literature now, there's less of anti Semitic anti American feeling. And less uh, literature, such literature. Should we be alarmed with this, with this type of literature? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Uh, I think it's more benign than we at first think that it is. Uh, first of all, it's not considered a uh, highbrow literature. So it is intended for very simple, very sort of little educated people. It's part of a general literature of occult. The Japanese love occult, like, for instance, Nostradamus, you know, the visions of Nostradamus, the prophecies. This has been a great bestseller in Japan until today. But this is part of this kind of literature. You have many bookstores who sell it, you read it on the train, you destroy it away when you get off the train, you forget about it. You don't really believe in these things. Now, one can tell, say, ask, how do you know? Maybe they do believe in it. So, in November 1988, the Anti-Defamation League of Negri, United States, and all of you know, was very much interested in this very question. How does this literature influence the Japanese? So they asked the, uh, the Japanese branch of Gala to conduct a public opinion poll and to find out what do the Japanese think. 1988, it was the highest of this literature. Now, what did this poll find out? Very interesting finding. First of all, 80% of the Japanese public never heard about this literature. Never heard about it. So, it was beneath their interest, as most Japanese never heard about other strange things in Japan. Only 20% heard, knew something based such a literature. So, how about this 20%? So they ask, after you have had, read one of these books, like Unuma Sanders and others, and protocols, has this changed your opinion of, did you become more hostile to the Jews uh, after you read it? Only 6% of the 20 said, yes, it made us, you know, be antagonistic to the Jews. It means that most of them, even when they read it, they didn't, uh, they were not, it did not produce anything in them. It's kind of the visions of Nostradamus. What do you make of it? You know, you read it, it's may, may be interesting, but who knows? That's why uh, I think we should differentiate between this literature in Europe, where it really has a great impact, or in the Middle East, in the Islamic world, and Japan, and probably also other East Asian countries, where it's very, very marginal. Although we have heard that the protocols are very influential in Japan, I wonder how many Japanese, if you meet, you know, maybe everyone of you have Japanese friends, and ask them, you know, do you know anything about the protocols? Have you read it? Do you know what it is, the protocol? My guess is very few Japanese you know, say that they ever heard about this uh, world. Um, And of course, the second reason that I don't think we should be alarmed is that sometimes, and quite often, people who read it become friends of Israel. As we just heard, 
the French people of Israel was headed once by such a Jewish expert who was set the protocols who wrote the anti-Semitic books. And even today, I have read, I met many of these people in the present day, and Israel Japan Friendship Associations, many of them joined. Why did they join these associations? It's not Israel not very popular in Japan. Why should a member of the Diet join such an association? Now the reason is because they believe in Jewish power. They believe in the what the protocols are saying that the Jews control the United States. The Jews control much of the world economy. So they should join it in order to learn from the Jews and also to use this Jewish immense power uh, for themselves. And uh, maybe we should compare it to the Japanese attitudes toward demons. Now, demons, you say, demonization, wow, the Jews are demons. But you know, in Japan, demons are cute. The Japanese don't regard the demons as very sinister. There's no setting. There are many demons. One of them is that demons are like a god, like a kami. Now, these demons are all around us. And they can be very beneficial if we treat them well. They can be very dangerous if we mistreat them or we ignore them. That's why the Japanese all the time you now have these ceremonies for the gods, you know, to pacify the demons. And uh, that's what they think about the Jews. They're like a demon, very strange, very something spiritual, but if they treat them well, very beneficial. If you mistreat them, it can be extremely dangerous. Now, I can, I'll finish with, again, a personal story of mine. And this happened in 1982, immediately after the war in Lebanon. I was in Japan, and I came across a little brochure of a new religious uh, group. You know, in Japan, religious groups, every year, the new religious group, all the time. They were well, made in Japan, and it's very easy in Japan to establish a new religion. So this was a new religion, headed by a woman, calling herself, it was a shaman woman, Shaman there, calling herself Ryugu of Hime, the uh, princess of the sea dragon, and there was a little brochure. Now, they're just, I am very much interested in Japanese uh, new religions, since I was a student, Professor Bogowski taught me once about Japanese uh, new religions, so I was interested in it. I opened it, and I said, wow, it is about the world situation. And it says, the world is in a great tragedy. A wars, revolutions, <coughs> violence in the world. So this is the first sentence. Second sentence. What is the relief? What is the reason that there are so many tragedies in the world? So many wars, so many revolutions, so much bloodshed, so much suffering. What's the reason? And the answer was the Jews. And I became even more interested in wow, you have a new religion, anti-Semitic, right? Saying that the Jews are responsible for all the bad things in the world. Next question was, why do the Jews commit so many bad things in the world. Why do they cause so much suffering in the world? And the answer was, because in the past, something very bad was done to the Jews. The Jews were treated very badly in the past. The Romans uh, destroyed their temple, they were dispersed in the world. So the angry spirit of the Jews, this is a very Japanese you know, idea, that a, a person who was killed in a was, I mean, was killed wrongly because he was innocent and was uh, uh, killed by some uh, by a bad person. His angry spirit takes revenge on your angry spirit. So the reason is that the angry spirit of the Jews cannot have rest until it takes revenge on the whole world. So the angry spirit of the Jews is causing all these troubles in the world. This is a very religious approach because it's a religious sect. So a religious explanation. And the last question was, how can we pacify this angry spirit of the Jews? What can we do? And the answer is, we should be very nice to the Jews. We should help them. We should be pro-Jewish. We should help Israel. So, anti-Semitic beliefs produce, on a religious level, a very philo-Semitic attitude. And this, I think, is very, uh, uh, very... Um, a symbol of what the Japanese think about it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think quite a remarkable uh, account.
uh, which leads me really with two brief reflections. One is that perhaps we should completely change our strategy as Jews and as Israelis and dig into the problem of anti-Semitism. It's obvious that we've been barking up the wrong tree. We it's very unfortunate members of the Global Forum have been discussing this question for two days now in Jerusalem. Uh, did not uh, choose to reflect on the Japanese case because the logic of what he described is that from now on not only should we admit finally to the world A, we do rule the world, we are very powerful and it would be a very good idea for the rest of the world to start behaving like the Japanese and try to pacify us <laughs> we might be a lot more successful we've never tried it worth a try. And you've also confirmed me in my predisposition to, um, to visit Japan as soon as possible. <laughs> because if this is a country that actually admires Jews for being smart and rich and also, you know, even interested in literary ways of anti-Semitism, this is, this is the place. This is a place where Israelis and Jews to go, particularly in the current climate. We should be looking towards Asia and convinced of that. Turn our backs on Europe, let's start looking towards Asia because they have the right attitude. Um, with those thoughts in mind, I want to turn to our last uh, respondent, uh, Professor Rotten Kovner, who um, is chair of the department at East. Asian Studies at the University of Haifa, and um, who also um, was the author of a, uh, an actor published by our center, this is the actor I even have it here, um, on ignorance, respect, and suspicion, current Japanese attitudes towards Jews, and has also recently published an article it's relevant, I think, to our discussion on Tokyo recognizes Auschwitz, the rise and fall of Holocaust denial in Japan, 1989-1999. I'm always uh, delighted to return here to the Hidden University, my uh, alma mater, and I'm thankful for uh, the, this invitation and the honor to be here tonight. This goes to my first teacher who introduced me to, <coughs> to Japan, Professor Benjamin Shimoni, and to Professor Robert District, the head of the Vidal Sassoon Center, with whom I worked, I had the privilege to work in the past. While I am fortunate to be here tonight, and probably misfortunate to be the last one to talk, <laughs> um, I had before me the two these two pillars of the research on the Japanese in the Jews. As you notice, probably, there are explicit differences between them, and I will try in this uh, um, presentation to give uh, not a summary, but to bridge between their views. I'd like uh, also to thank Professor Goodman for his uh, panoramic and web research presentation. Although it deals ostensibly with a narrowly defined uh, topic, this paper touches broad uh, the much broader study. In the last decade, we have benefited greatly from Professor Goodman's insights on the Japanese attitude toward the, the Jews. His seminar book, Jews in the Japanese Mind, is a true landmark in this field and an indispensable reading to anyone who studies Japanese attitude to the other in general and foreigners in particular. I want to emphasize today the broader context because the whole concept of Jews in Japan and the derivative anti-Semitism but also philo-Semitism are indeed a peculiar phenomenon. As it was represented earlier, I would just like to uh, repeat some of the points. Japan lacks most of the sources and causes that characterize anti-Semitic attitudes in other nations. 
Let me mention a few of this. First, anti-Semitism in Japan has not evolved from any encounter with Jews. The Jewish community in Japan consists these days about a little more than 1,000 1, members. The Japanese do not, virtually cannot distinguish between Jews and other Western residents. Japanese anti-Semitism does not have long roots. It started only in the 20th century. Similarly, it does not have any religious roots. Anti-Semitism in Japan has never gained a fully governmental support, nor it become a national ideology. It has neither developed because of the significant conflict between Israel and Japan, as we find in certain Arab or uh, Muslim countries. In fact, anti-Semitism has never penetrated the lower classes in Japan, nor it has any popular support. Finally, it, it has appeared almost only in a written form and never deteriorated to the realm of damage or to material or physical attacks on Jews. The Jews, as you probably understood, are basically an imaginary figures. To add to the vivid, vivid examples Professor Shironi had brought before, I will just tell you that when I used to present myself in Japan as an Israeli, usually drew some distance, some often even repulsion, because Israel is associated with the Middle East, quite a backward uh, area. But if I would prefer to designate myself, to define myself as a Jewish person, as a Jew, it would draw much warmer um, comments, and the first one would be, ah, Tamagai, it means you are probably smart. We do pay more than we do we pay to similar attitude in other East Asian nations. Professor Goodman has always emphasized the context of the Japanese attitudes to, to Jews, and even the title of his book, Jews in the Japanese Mind, stresses these unilateral relations. That is, the Jews have by far greater role in the Japanese cultural and national discourse than the Japanese have had in the Jewish discourse. Well, there are several explanations. The first one we heard today is a relation and imitation of leading culture the rise of anti-Semitism in Japan and the emergence of the protocols can be viewed as a mere emulation of foreign trends and fads. The attraction for the protocols was related originally to an anti-communist -anti white Russian fascination. The first wave of anti-anti-Semitic writings during the 30s and the 40s was in relation of German writings. And even the recent wave of anti-Semitic writings in the latter half of the 80s is an echo, probably, of a global surge in anti-Semitism anti elsewhere. Jews also displace um, xenophobic feelings towards foreigners in general. Some observer, observers have suggested that the Japanese anti-Jewish phenomenon is actually an indirect way of expressing resentment against foreigners in general. general. Citing number of legal, sorry, uh, rising, the rising number of legal and illegal workers during the recession period reignited Japanese xenophobia. One example used to support this theory is a demonstration held in Tokyo in the spring of 1993 by ultra right wing groups who used Nazi, uh, Nazi uh, swastikas on the posters when calling for the expulsion of illegal immigrants. Jews also reflect the image of Israel and the stance of Japan toward the Arab, Arab world. The image, image of the Jews may have been affected by the negative image of Israel in the last 40 50 years. Jews also related to the way Japanese interpret their own nation. Jews are used to facilitate internal needs. They serve as a beacon of Japan's quest for self-definition as an explanation for Japan's current problem. This discourse, which goes probably for about 100 years, is known as Nihonjin Ron. The theories or discussions about Japan or Japanese -ness. 
This argument seems useful when dealing with several issues. First of all, by discussing the Jews, there is a kind of reinforcement of sense of uniqueness. Since their early history, as a nation, the Japanese have evoked and manipulated images of foreigners, often far from reality, but in accordance with certain social and political agenda, in order to define their own identity. Jews, in this sense, served as a quintessential other, which contrasts the Japanese in any of their traits. One example is uh, Yamamoto Shichie, um, publisher and a writer, and uh, his famous book, the most famous book, The Japanese and the Jews, a bestseller in 1970. Yamamoto continued the earlier trends of treating the Jews as the archetype of the other, facilitated comfortable course for other Nihonjiron theorists to keep comparing the Japanese with the Jews. Jews can also serve as an explanation for economic distress, and therefore we can see that the new wave of anti antisemitic writings was uh, was began in the key period of the beginning of economic of economic problems in the end of the 80s and beginning of the 90s. There is another issue here which should be mentioned, which is unrelated neither to the Jews nor to the, nor to the Japanese, and this is demand and supply. Side by side with national needs and psychological motives, there may be additional factors. Uh, one is that I, I think it's a commercial success. The outlandish commercial success of the of Yamamoto's, the Japanese and the Jews, which was sold with, uh, in more than one million copies, led to a wave of publication, partially because the topic appeared to be a golden mine for publisher and flexible writer. The supply of books that attracted new writers and new readership that previously may have no, no idea about this topic. The last one is uh, attraction to occultism. I have the feeling that in Japan it's maybe stronger than in other places. The interest in Jews is due to their image as a small and secluded group which influences the control and controls world of earth. There is an, in Japan, exceptional interest in occultism, supernatural phenomena, and wide range of conspiracies. Within this media, the Jews, as unfamiliar or legendary people, play the role of world manipulators. In 1995-1996, I conducted a wide survey among uh, university students, almost uh, more than 500 students, and this uh, survey confirmed only some of these aspects. My reading of the success of anti-Semitic literature suggests, and this and here I quote what I have written uh, about nine years ago, that it, it is associated with the traditionally sinister image of the Jews. The Japanese perceive them as a small group, often smaller than it is in reality, of detached and asocial people. Even young Japanese possess a deep-seated image of the Jews, even though it, is, it may be unconscious as a group which conspires to harm others. This notion is encouraged by attraction to occult writing and by an old belief in the threat on Japan posed by foreign powers. End quote. The protocol in this sense combined both long-term demonization of Jews, already more than 80 years in Japan, with an occult image of a sinister group that clandestinely gathered and planned to rule the world. It is really not important, as Ota, one of the uh, Japanese mentioned here before, it is not in really important, as he admitted, if the book is genuine. The belief in the existence existence of such a, ma a manu manipulated group is currently stronger than any reputation. It also serves by far more important and unrelated goal than none of the authors of the original manuscript could imagine, I mean, Russian uh, authors.
The next question is what is the impact of the protocols? This is a very short uh, comment here. There have been various views on the actual significance of the of Japanese of the Japanese anti-Semitic writings and their impact on the Japanese society. They range from alarmist fears to calm sarcasm over this phenomenon. Some specialists argue that the Japanese anti-Semitism lead to Jewish hatred and anti-Israeli views, while others suggest that it is a marginal phenomenon that may even reinforce positive image, images of the successful group that we have today, thereby providing Jews and the State of Israel some credit they not necessarily deserve. My own reading of the impact of this phenomenon is that the exposure to anti-Semitic literature does not, I repeat, does not lead to substantial shift in the in perception of, Jewish, of the Jewish image, but it tends to slightly underscore its positive and negative facets. In some cases, and for some individuals, it may lead to suspicion and distrust while for others, it may lead to admiration and even benefit, uh, and even benefits. The majority, let's face it, the majority of Japanese are ignorant of the protocols and unaware of the long legacy of anti-Semitism in the world and in Japan. At the same time, here may be the final point, I believe that the long, intensive writings, long, period of the wave of writings, and I don't know if, how much you can imagine that in the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, there were bookshops in the very wide uh, scale Japanese uh, bookshops with bookshops of Jewish literature. The Jewish shelf was such an important issue. So, after the long exposure and during a, a long, intensive wave of writings, it may slowly affect public opinion in a negative way, this is my opinion. Finally, how can we change the situation, or simply, is there anything we can do about it? Since the emergence of anti-Semitic, uh, the recent anti-Semitic wave in Japan, there have been various attempts of Jewish organizations to halt it. The most fruitful activities took place during the Marco Polo affair, which arguably led to the demise. Uh, the Marco Polo affair was a publication of the Holocaust denial article. Auschwitz did not exist in January 1995. Exactly by chance, the same month of the Om uh, Shiniki attack on the subway. And uh, arguably this uh, campaign against the, uh, this uh, Holocaust denial writings led to the demise of the journal, there are different uh, interpretations about it, and to more, more importantly a public debate about the issue. Professor Goodman justly criticized at that time the Japanese failure to engage foreigners in an open debate <coughs> and conducted, conducting, I am quoting here, an intense, solipsistic monologue about Jews and anti-Semitism. He also contended at that time that such a reaction was typical of the way many Japanese had dealt with the outside world for centuries. While I agree with him in this point, I still think that it was a breakthrough in 1995, the whole debate about the Jewish uh, Jewish writing and the Jewish place, in, Jewish place in, in the Japanese mind. I still think it was a breakthrough in the Japanese intellectual treatment of this issue in the last 20 years. The Jewish reaction and the Japanese response to it provide some insights for future dealings with Holocaust denial, denial activities and the broader phenomenon of intellectual, of so called intellectual anti Semitism in countries with limited acquaintance with Jews, such as Japan. First, we may defense, first, any defense against anti-Semitism requires a body, a body that surveys the media 
the walls of any expression of anti-Semitism. One of the reasons Japanese politicians and the media repeatedly express ethnocentric Uh, one of the reasons that the Japanese media and various politicians express ethnocentric prejudice against foreigners and often uh, even racist remark, remarks is the, their intrinsic belief that foreigners cannot read or understand them because of language difficulties. The success of the Jewish campaign after almost a decade of feeble and futile protests suggests that appealing to editors and publishers' goodwill is ineffective since they are often interested in a well-published scandals and consequently higher sales. Also, leaving sporadic cases of anti-Semitic anti -Semitic writings without a response, waiting for a local media to react does not solve the problem, but stimulate interest and demand for further publication. While I do believe that the full solution to the tide of anti-Semitic writings lies mostly in internal factors within the Japanese society, unrelated to the Jews or Israel, the most efficient way to deal with it is to launch fully orchestrated operations that combine the use of Japanese and foreign media, criticism of well-known foreigner, foreigner personalities, political intervention, and even economic sanctions. When all are realized, as happened in the Marco Polo affair, briefly, we may witness the continuation of a slow change, positive, positive change, until some may sardonically add another group emerges as a scapegoat. Thank you very much. I'm holding my hand in Japanese, which was written by myself upside down. <laughs> which must prove something. I'm not quite sure what it proves, but it certainly proves an interest in the subject, which may be, of course, more ambiguous than it seems at first sight. But here we are. This, this will be the translation into Japanese. Yeah. Uh, as far as books in Japanese are concerned, in addition to Professor Westridge's uh, uh, volume, uh, I, I should say that I, I in my book, uh, was very critical of uh, the Japanese intellectual community for its response to this deluge of, of uh, books about the Jews in the mid-1980s. Uh, and I said so in my book. And I'm happy to report that although the Japanese, uh, the Japanese scholars have remained very reticent to address this phenomenon head on and engage in public criticism of uh, Ino Masami or any of these other authors, uh, they have responded by producing quite a large number of very serious uh, studies of Jews, uh, a large number of translations of, of good uh, and uh, scholarly works of Western uh, literature on the Constitution, a variety of, of, of subjects, everything from the Mishnah uh, to, uh, uh, to the Holocaust. And so I think, in general, the, the response of the Japanese intellectual community has been to avoid direct polemical en engagement and instead to produce uh, countervailing uh, kinds of, of materials, and in this I think they've been quite successful. And uh, the, Jap the, the number and quality of Japanese scholars of Judaism, uh, uh, the Middle East situation, uh, uh, and of, you know, sociologists of all kinds, of people, of liturgy, of Yiddish, uh, and the, the, the sheer number of these people has increased, and the quality of them is, is, is really um, quite good. So on that score, it's, uh, uh, it's good. Uh, as far as the impact of, of Arab oil uh, and so forth, I think that uh, uh, there have been, this is a big topic, and I don't think we have time to, it's a little bit off the subject uh, that I was addressing. Um, 
in 1973, at the time of the Arab oil embargo, Japan was very vulnerable to Arab oil, um, was very dependent upon oil from the Middle East and very vulnerable to Arab oil pressure. Uh, and they were, because they're, they're very bright and think far ahead and are, think, think strategically, uh, Japan is in a much better position today. Um, uh, it has strategic reserves, it has alternative sources, but it knows how to play the spot market much better than it did in those days. Uh, and so it's not much less vulnerable to pressure uh, you know, this kind of so-called oil blackmail. Um, in addition, I think Japan was, was very, very upset with what happened during the 1991 Gulf War. Uh, Japan was accused of dithering, uh, of, of, wait, uh, of not participating, uh, and then of, of uh, what was called checkbook diplomacy. By some accounts, uh, the Japanese spent, paid as much as $17 billion uh, toward the cost of the war, uh, which was essentially what the war cost. So they wound up um, paying for the war, but at the same time being criticized uh, for not having participated and, and being labeled uh, checkbook diplomats. Uh, they were misled badly by the so-called Middle East scholars of Japan at the time, who appeared 24 hours a day on the television and couldn't get anything right. They misconstrued and misunderstood what was happening uh, in every detail. And I, I was there and I watched them on television. The Japanese government was totally uh, misinformed, uh, at least by the public and the lecturers, uh, uh, of what was happening. Um, and uh, in, the, in the aftermath, I think that the, the uh, uh, Professor Shaloni and uh, he would confirm whether this or correct me, but it seems to me that relations with Israel uh, changed, the relationship with the Palestinians uh, in the aftermath has, has changed quite considerably. So I think that, that, that Japan, while in the 70s and 80s had a sort of more Arab leaning in their policy because of, of oil uh, and because of the influence of the left, in the period since the first Gulf War, I think the Japanese have become less susceptible to oil pressure and less um, sympathetic with the Palestinians. Although they continue, they continue to have, uh, they continue to, to try to keep a balanced uh, relationship. It's it's less, it's less uh, favorable to the, to the Arab side. Um, I, I, I'll stop there and let my colleagues uh, answer some of these other questions. That is. And it's also influential in some circles, in the course of the information, there are some parts of the extreme left, of radical students, who um, became, let's say, anti-Israel, but in a good part, and also anti-Semitic. Because of this Arab, Palestinian, left-wing literature, which says that Israel and the Jews are part of the Arab to Asian things. So there is an influence, but it's, it's the whole left is now losing influence in Japan, and the extreme left is not what it used to be. I think this danger is decreasing, but I would say that the new left in Japan, maybe more than the right, yeah. became anti-Semitic, or at least used uh, anti-Semitism in its uh, propaganda and its uh, ideology. Now, powerful books to fight anti-Semitism. Again, it, this question is based on the assumption that these books are really anti-Semitic, and what is needed is to refute them. But first of all, the Japanese don't regard these books as anti-Semitic, most of them anti-Semitic. They regard them sometimes as being very praise, praising the Jews. And as I said, this book by Fujita Den, it became a huge bestseller, one of the greatest bestsellers. Maybe it even sold more than Uno Masami. It was translated into Korean, into Chinese. It became bestseller in Korea. It became bestseller in China. Because everyone in East Asia wants to know the Jewish business practices. Because everyone wants to succeed in business nowadays in East Asia. So to have such a book, you know, for a little small amount of money, you can learn how to be a good businessman. 
So it's like a manual for being a good businessman. So, of course, there are people who say in the Israel embassy, they always say, maybe we ask some Japanese to write another book, who we'll say, you know, how ah, to all these things. Some people uh, wrote such books, but it didn't sell at all. <laughs> because people like to read these conspiracy books. They don't like to read books that refute conspiracy. If you write a book that says that post Shodano's prophecies are really wrong, nobody will buy the book. So, it doesn't... The question is not who will buy the book, but who will buy the book. As you asked about the Holocaust. Oh yes, the Japanese were very much interested in the Holocaust. And, for instance, you take the diary of Anne Frank, it was a huge bestseller. And it still sells in Japan. I think there are more pe Japanese people who read the diary of Anne Frank than Israelis. And this book is more known in Japan. If you just ask your students, or students here, who read this book, and ask in Japan who read this book, you find more Japanese who read the diary of Anne Frank. And Japanese need of Arab oil, it, of course it affected the attitude toward Israel very much. Because, uh, you yeah, know, if you were a Japanese businessman, or a Japanese government official, that your country needs the Arab oil, you cannot be blamed for, for doing everything to, to keep that oil. But did it influence the students? Of course not. Because the students were influenced by the propaganda of the New Left in the West, and the Palestinians, whereas the businessmen were, of course, interested about by the need of oil. Now, protocols killed the people in Japan. I think it was a good man meant in a very figurative way. He didn't really mean that the protocols killed the Japanese. It, because, you know, Aung Shin Rikyo, their enemies, great enemies, the Japanese government, Japanese establishment, and the United States, and all the Western governments, and the Jews. So, we are part of the whole world that Aung Shin Rikyo hates. But, you know, after Aung Shin Rikyo did these things, he didn't do it against the Jews. He never thought of hurting Jews in Japan. He did it again, Japanese government officials were fighting government. After they did it, and after they were uh, uh, suppressed and they were outlawed as an organization, they were uh, broken up. Now they reorganized, they were allowed to reorganize. And of course, they had to choose another name. Hong Shin Rikyo was uh, abolished, it had to be abolished, the government would not allow it to come back. So they said, okay, we'll call ourselves another name. Now, you have so many words in the Japanese language that you can use. <laughs> you know what they chose? Aleph. The Hebrew word Aleph. Not Alpha, the Greek word. That's Aleph. Not because they didn't know it. They chose it because they knew it. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which shows that they have this respect. That on the other hand, they have all this anti-Semitic literature. On the other hand, they have a great respect for Jewish culture and want to call themselves by a Jewish name. Would you think of any Western anti-Semitic group calling itself Aleph? So, I don't think that, that you should be afraid that Aung Shin are going to kill Jews in Japan or in the world. They are, in this, in this sense, who, the one who has to fear about the Japanese government, of course. And the Japanese government does not fear anymore the option we fear. Because I think uh, the whole thing is blown out and the uh, leader, uh, Shoko, Asahara Shoko, got the uh, death sentence, as you know. Uh, it's, it's the end of what used to be on the Observe, uh, Professor Shaloni and I have slightly different views, and I just want to uh, underscore uh, the difference a little bit. Uh, uh, I did not mean that um, the protocol's influence on Ohm was figurative. I meant it literally. Uh, I think that there's, there's quite a lot of textual evidence that they were, that they took the uh, protocols literally and they acted on them. Uh, I, I would like to, I think that, um, uh, uh, Ohm was very serious about trying to save the world in, in, uh, 
Robert Lifted wrote a book about Ohm, and he titled it Destroying the World to Save It, this kind of uh, millenarian impulse. And they, they were quite serious about it. They were not unsophisticated. These were people with uh, Tokyo University education. Um, uh, I, I think that there's, I, I don't have time today to talk about it, but there's a parallel with the attack uh, on, in 1972, May 30th, when the Red Army uh, disembarked in, at Blood Airport and shot up the disembarkation uh, lobby. They, they also uh, believed that they were uh, trying to save the world through world revolution, and killing Jews was somehow uh, a method to do this. Uh, the part that I think is figurative, the metaphorical, is the fact that, that Ohm was killing metaphorical Jews. They, they, they defined these people in the subway as somehow part of this world Jewish conspiracy, just as they did in the, in the slide that I showed. Uh, uh, so, so I, you know, I'm, I, I don't, I'm not talking figuratively. What I'm saying is, well, I can give you another example. On April 20th, 1995, Timothy McVeigh drove up in front of the Oklahoma City Federal Building in Oklahoma City uh, in a truck loaded with fuel oil and fertilizer. And he set it up, he, he, ex he, he exploded it. Uh, he blew up the building and killed 168 people. And he modeled his actions on, on a novel called The Turner Diaries. I'm sure you're familiar with mm -hmm. this. The Turner Diaries is a fictional, uh, a fictional account based on the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion is an incitement to murder. And whether, it, whether you know, this, this document, uh, whether you, you know, you do it now, you do it later, the fact that it's, that it, that it, at one point or another, my view is that sooner or later, somebody is going to act out this fantasy. And it's happened over and over again. Uh, and it's happened in the United States. It's not only in Japan. Uh, I don't see why we should think that somehow this is because it's, it happens in Japan. It's cute or amusing. I don't think it's funny. And I don't take it, I, I, you know, maybe I'm overly serious about this, but, uh, um, you know, I, I think that everything that, that Professor Shalomi said was true. Uh, and, uh, but I think, um, you know, I, I specifically wanted, you know, in my paper, I avoided using the word anti-Semitism, and I, because I, I think that we should separate the question of anti-Semitism from the question of whether you know, how the protocol is used, how it's construed, and whether or not it leads to acts of violence. I think that the overwhelming evidence is that the protocols of the elders of Zion, whether it's in Japan or the United States or Argentina or anywhere else, leads to mass murder. And I don't see any evidence to the contrary. I just came from a two and a half day conference in Tel Aviv where paper after paper after paper documented this. And I just, I, I simply don't agree with Professor Saloni that this is cute. Um, well, as for the books, there is certainly very wide, I mean, a lot of literature, serious literature about the history of the Jews, anti-Semitism, the Holocaust in Japan. I'm just coming back from a three months uh, stay in Japan, and in most of the libraries I visited, I couldn't find any anti Semitic uh, literature, but also only serious literature, so called serious literature. At the same time, this serious literature has probably remained uh, the domain of scholars, while this uh, simple, simplistic uh, anti Semitic writing is what the ordinary layman reads when he goes to work. So here comes the question of which literature is more uh, influential and which, what can we look for uh, to counter it. In fact, the question could be, what do we want? A correct image, if there is such a thing, or a useful image? 
and uh, from another view maybe could be the whole issue is uh, from at least a Jewish perspective how dangerous <coughs> is the image. I would like to go back to the figures Professor Shaloni uh, gave before. Only 20% are familiar with uh, with the anti-Semitic literature. This means 25 million people. Out of them, only 6% have changed their mind. I mean, their mind, uh, their opinion deteriorated. This means one and a half million. This is a lot of people. One and a half million. Okay, and, the, okay. and the, the illiterate, of course. And uh, among this, it's enough several hundreds, or even tens of people, or a few tens, but, uh, to make um, an attack on the Lord Airport. I don't want to uh, directly link the two uh, issues, but could be. Or uh, the attack on the on the Tokyo subway and therefore this image is a negative image and the question is how can we change it um, I don't have here any uh, constructive uh, suggestion beyond what I said before and clearly this is a, a long process that cannot be solved by one book or one um, decisive book that we change Tens, decades of uh, negative writing. Finally, as for the Japanese um, government stance and the Israeli uh, Israeli policy, I think there is a very limited link between the anti anti-Semitic writing and the Israeli stance. You can see, it especially after uh, 1991, when the Israeli uh, the policy vis-à-vis -vis Israel became much more positive at the same time uh, anti-Semitic uh, writings were uh, on the rise. The Japanese government at the same time did not do anything to prevent these uh, writings, either legally or by any other influence. And clearly, the negative policies against Israel during several decades could have been a fertile ground for leadership of anti-Semitic literature. Thank you very much. First of all, thanking our three participants. We had a very rich, diverse uh, set of viewpoints, and if the differences became clearer, more defined in answer to some of these questions. But I think that it's a very um, varied kaleidoscope question of whether or not this anti-Semitism, any form of anti-Semitism, and especially the protocols of the other design, could, under some circumstances, be more, or I, I hesitate to use the word benign, I don't believe it can ever be benign, as Professor Bruno suggested, but certainly there is a different take on it, a different perception uh, in, in Japan that we have, we have learned about. I want especially to thank Professor Bruno who was our particular guest uh, in the board for having presented uh, I think a very um, a very worthwhile and uh, uh, and uh, important presentation which will which will require us to think more deeply about about the question of the protocols and our two respondents who both provided uh, very stimulating responses the audience especially the hardcore that is rested with us to this moment deserves uh, to applaud itself. And I would like to thank the, uh, the staff of the Centre for once again having provided us with a very, um, uh, and a very stimulating uh, evening. And um, we, will, uh, we will think and chew over these issues. Thank you very much.